Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining our first of February project echo session. And by first of February, I don't mean February 1st, I mean the first session for the month of February. Um, as you uh, can see, we still have folks uh, joining us from the waiting room, but as it is currently three o'clock, we're going to get things started. My name is Rory Farrand, and I'm the Vice President um, of Palliative and Advanced Care here at NHPCO. And it's my pleasure to welcome to you, welcome you to our 2023 Project Echo, oh, excuse me, Project Echo series, Equity Where It Matters. Today's topic is supporting African American patients at end of life. And as I mentioned earlier, or no, I didn't mention, but I will mention, we are hosting these sessions twice a month across the entirety of 2023. And we are really excited to have you with us here today. So let me just take a moment to introduce you to the members of NHPCO's Project ECHO Hub Team. We are all here on the slide, as you can see, and if you have any questions or need technical assistance during today's session, any member of the NHPCO team has NHPCO after their name, and we also have the Zoom background for, with the Project ECHO logo on it to help you identify somebody who can be of assistance. Feel free to take advantage of the chat feature and let any of us know how we can help you. Now, before we get started, I'd like to review a little bit of housekeeping in the event that this happens to be your first time joining one of our Project ECHO sessions. Related to disclosure, the planners and faculty of today's session have attested that they do not have any financial relationships with commercial interests. As part of the greater Project ECHO movement, we support the collection of participation data. This data allows Project ECHO to measure, analyze, and report on the movement's reach. Data may also be used in reports on maps and visualizations for research, for communication and surveys, for data quality assurance activities and for decision-making related to new initiatives. Following today's session, you will receive an email with a link to complete an evaluation survey and we respectfully request that you complete the survey within 48 hours. The evaluation is a requirement for quality connections credit and equally important, the information from the evaluation helps us improve future Project ECHO sessions. Some of our attendees may be interested in obtaining a certificate of participation in this year's Project ECHO series. If you fall into that category, we would also ask that you complete a short learning activity as well upon the conclusion of today's session. Now, another word on ground rules and teleconferencing etiquette. Project ECHO is an all share, all learn, all teach format, and we do not condone judging anyone's contribution. Now, that isn't to say that you have to agree with each perspective the perspective that's presented, diversity of ideas and thought, of course, is critical to learning. However, we ask that differences of opinion and perspective are communicated in a respectful manner. Whether this is your first time or you're a tenured attendee, please introduce yourself each time you're speaking. It's difficult sometimes in a large group to see which square is lit up when someone talks. And speaking of talking, one person should speak at a time. And unless you happen to be the one speaking, please keep yourself on mute in order to reduce or eliminate any environmental distractions for the other attendees. Project ECHO sessions also ask that you disregard rank or status. We are all here to learn together. And as these sessions are video conferences, we request that you turn on your camera so we can see you and maintain eye contact. We like to replicate the idea that we're all together, even though we're spread across the country. And not the least important bit, if you're speaking about a patient, Please do not disclose any protected health information or otherwise personally identifiable information. While the case studies we review in these sessions are based on actual patients, we do our utmost to protect patient and family privacy. Now, our agenda for today. Today we are going to talk, we're gonna introduce the uh, faculty. We're gonna have a brief didactic presentation. As I mentioned, the title is Supporting African-American Patients at the End of Life. Following that, there will be a case study fighting to the end, African-Americans and end-of-life decisions. After that, we will have a discussion that is where we ask you to weigh in and ask questions, uh, present suggestions, things like that. And then we will cover some key takeaways and of course, uh, close the session as we always do. Now, let me take a moment to introduce you to our faculty. We are excited to welcome today, Dr. Altanya Garrett. She's the Executive Director of Accent Care located in Washington, DC, as well as the founding Executive Director for Capital Caring Center for Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity. She has served as a senior advisor, Innovation and Health Equity at National Partnership for Health Care and Hospice, or NIPI, and is a member of ACHE. We also have Dr. Elisha Hall, who is an African-American Engagement Director at Compassion and Choices located in Illinois, and is the founder of African-American and Indigenous Knowledge Institute, or AIKI. 
Thank you, faculty. We are excited to have you here and I'll turn things over to you. Thank you, Rory. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Rory. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm not a doctor yet, but I'll take it. Thanks. Um, that made me smile. But um, we're here today to talk about supporting African American um, patients at the end of life. And as February begins, the celebration of Black History Month, it's an honor and privilege to speak about this topic today on February 2nd. So Black and African-American communities utilize hospice care significant, at significantly lower rates than other groups in the United States. In 2020, 1.72 million Medicare beneficiaries were enrolled in hospice care for more than one day. And of that, 47.8% of all Medicare descendants receive hospice care. So looking deeper here at this slide, NHPCO's facts and figures report shares the breakdown by race, where in 2020, utilization of Medicare beneficiaries was 50.8, I'm sorry, 50.8% white, 36.1% Asian American, 35.5% Black or African American, 33.5% Hispanic, and 33.3% American Indian Alaskan Native. Uh, so next slide, please. So why is utilization um, lower in Black and African-American community? Um, there are some key uh, root causes that have created barriers. And some of them are listed here on the slide. These include residential segregation um, and structural barriers like racism, implicit bias, uh, racial reconstructive covenants, higher interest rate uh, mortgage loans and redlining, unfavorable property appraisals, and equitable de uh, delivery of education, and lower economic and employment opportunities, and uh, disproportionate availability of healthcare based on geography and certain zip codes. All of these roots, these factors, contribute to some of the day-to-day -day barriers or considerations that we must recognize when working with African-American patients and families. For example, in the next slide, we see uh, oftentimes uh, barriers that exist could be those where there's a feeling of abandonment of caregiving or uh, an abandonment of caregiving roles and responsibilities. As there's an ethos that we care for our own, we take care of our own. Um, there's misconceptions and thoughts of hastening death. Um, also, there's a general lack of awareness and sometimes just understanding of, you know, if there's a location or cost of services uh, that causes an issue or, or barrier for, for some. And then commonly we talk about the mistrust of the healthcare system and, and um, government funded programs. So taking a pause here to look more at the causes of the mistrust of the healthcare system, we see the listing of Tuskegee study, um, gynecological uh, experimentation and improper pain assessments. So historically there is a medical and scientific abuse that was unethical in experimentation and overutilization of African-Americans as test subjects for training and teaching. And as I shared most commonly, the Tuskegee study is what we talk about a lot when it comes to mistrust of the healthcare system. And this experiment took place for 40 years from 1932 into 1972. And this was where men were treated, being treated for syphilis. However, the treatment was withheld, the treatment and cure for this was withheld from black men and it increased the morbidity and mortality amongst them. And even before then, we have things in the 19th century where enslaved Black women were given surgical uh, surgery procedures after childbirth injuries without numbing agents or anesthesia um, to test out the effect. Uh, I can't talk, sorry. To test out the efficacy of different procedures. Um, and pain medication wasn't given because people believed that Black people didn't feel pain. And on that note, there's more racial bias in current studies today that show racial bias and pain assessment and treatment recommendations uh, as it relates to biological differences or perceived biological differences between black and white people. So these kind of examples are the foundation of what we say we have mistreatment of the healthcare system. Um, these were built on that foundation. Other barriers and considerations are uh, spiritual and religi religious belief practices. And we'll talk more about this in the next slide, um, please. So the role of faith in religion in the Black and African American communities is significant, whereas 47% of the community attend church at least once per week. 
This is compared to 39% of Hispanic and Latino community, 34% of white uh, community and other mixed communities, and 26% for the Asian, Asian communities where they were, uh, attend church at least once per week. So for African-Americans or many African-Americans, religion and church is a fundamental, uh, is fundamental to, their, to, to everything, to the knowledge, to life's vision. And there's a core belief that God is in charge and that the pastors play a key role as well. And finally, there's always hope and hope for a miracle um, at serious illness will always exist. And to further illustrate the importance of religion and faith, um, NHPCO's uh, study with when they did the DEI lens, um, hospice through a DEI lens, that study showed that 59% versus 50% um, of respondents, 59% of black respondents versus 50% of white respondents um, significantly would like to have spiritual or religious component of hospice in their, in their care. Um, so religion plays a major role and faith is key in a lot of African-Americans lives and how they make decisions when it comes to uh, end of life care and plans. And so Dr. Hall will now explore more about advanced care planning and um, what that looks like for African-American communities. So Dr. Hall. Thank you, Altonia, that was excellent. And I think you did a great job talking about uh, the medical mistrust. And uh, one of the things we actually are seeing is that there's a movement beyond medical mistrust and into medical racism because medical mistrust actually puts too much emphasis and responsibility on African-American and Black people and not enough on the actual structures and the systems in place that actually create that in the first place. And so I think the, it sound that we um, are starting to see that shift the framework and I think it's uh, important for this discussion as well. Um, and so what does that mean then for how we think about and talk about uh, advanced care planning? Um, for uh, us at Compassion and Choices, we talk about advanced care planning and, and advanced directives as a general term um, for any document that contains instructions pertaining to a person's wish list related to medical treatment um, if they cannot make care decisions on their own. So, you know, we're talking about everyone over 18 should have an advanced directive to increase the likelihood that you will get the care that you want. Um, you know, and common advanced directives include things like a living will, you know, what do you really want to see uh, when you transition, when you die? What do you want to have in place? Where do you want things to go? Uh, we also talk about medical durable power of attorney. Who will speak for you when you are gone? Uh, this person is sometimes referred to as a healthcare proxy uh, and is extremely important in seeing your wishes through. So we advise people to name these kinds of people and positions and, and um, put teeth, if you will, put concrete, concretize, if you will, these kind of decisions that you are going to have so that people can make the best decisions on your behalf when you are gone. Um, we also talk about, you know, do not resuscitate and do not incubate orders um, or simple orders that indicating when or if you want this care to even happen. Okay, which is extremely important. You know, we may not, oh, that's not going to happen to me or it may not happen to me, but maybe even in saying I do want this or I don't want this helps your family members out because it's really hard as a family member that's grieving to also have to figure out what would my family member have wanted. Uh, so we are, encourage people, especially in, uh, in the Black and African American community, to plan um, and, and to name and to answer these kinds of questions. Um, and then lastly, we talk about post uh, medical order, um, you know, just kind of, you know, but this is something that happens on a case by case basis. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we also talk about considerations that you may have to think about when when we're talking about advanced care planning. Um, and what are some of the benefits of like ongoing events, uh, health care planning conversations. So why would you want to have these conversations with your family? Well, um, you get a better chance that you and your loved ones and healthcare providers will honor your healthcare wishes. So we've, uh, Tonya did a great job talking about how um, oftentimes our healthcare wishes are not honored in these spaces. And so it is extremely important that we name these kinds of things. We see this often, uh, another example is in the birthing space where you're putting together what it is that you want, you, you know, how, what kind of birth that you want. And, and sometimes, you know, we're not honored in that space either, right? 
but we have to make plans, we have to name it, and we have to give everyone the benefit of the doubt so that they can work on our behalf. Um, this creates less confusion and um, less family conflict. Um, and I think we all see this. It's not. This is not a, a uh, something that is an ethnic group or or you know racially uh, se you know segregated. Every person, every group of, of people across the planet, when someone leaves and these kind of plans have not been created, it creates conflict and it can lead to confusion. And and so we really want to emphasize this. I, I can't emphasize enough. And we've seen it even in the black community um, with people who are, are celebrities. You know, um, you know, thinking about Chadwick Boseman. You know, all of the and even recently, people who are have money and who have passed on and did not leave directions for their family. Um, number three, you know, a gift of love for those who uh, will need to make decisions. This is kind of like a love offering. And so if you're able to give them this, this is kind of like a way that you can kind of care for them in your absence so that they don't have to uh, do it on their own. And um, again, you know, because ultimately, if you don't make the decisions, now they have to take a decision to multiple people and ask what they think you would have wanted and that's when things can get messy. Um, we also, you know, are all about modeling for children and parents and friends. So if you create a plan, you are literally shifting the generational narr narrative and framework and say, hey, we are a family that plans. We are a family that creates wills. We are a family that takes care of these things uh, because we want to plan, um, be prepared for, for the inevitable, and we are okay with conversations about death and transition. Um, and I often, you know, for me, I often connected as well to our African and indigenous uh, communities and practices and traditions because in those communities where, you know, where we are, we are connected, transition is something that is revered as honored eldership is something that is revered and honored and it is and and so we must embrace that here as well as as, as african american people um in addition you know we are all about advanced directives that can combine both pieces you know kind of the what and the who so um it's not simply just saying you know what you want or it's not just simply saying who you whom you might want you know to do x y and z but it's putting both of those together um, and in addition to that documents and regulations change from state to state so as you start to move through this process you actually can learn um, what policies are in place what state laws may exist that you may um, need and or um, uh, you know may influence how you make the decisions you you want to make and how you want to move uh, once you have transition. Um, in, in addition to that, some states have multiple documents, others, uh, you know, just have, you know, one or a few. So, you know, Compassion Choices End of Life Information Center has links um, to all state pages. We have documents for you if you want to um, go have a book, an end of life care, uh, you know, kind of uh, a manual and, and, and toolkit so that you can have everything you need. Um, and then lastly, you know, people can use these forms, um, you know, and instructions about state to specific regulations so that, you know, you have all the recommendations there for you. Next slide, please. Lastly, um, African Americans are less likely to complete advanced directives and are more likely to prefer uh, more aggressive treatment. So kind of Altonia was kind of going through a little bit of that. Um, and, you know, that means that they're not going through the, the car. They, they, they want to see mechanical like ventilations and feeding tubes. They don't, and so because they don't complete the directives, they actually are seeing these more aggressive treatments. And so um, we need to know in advance, do you want those treatments? Is this something that you um, or your loved one wants? If you don't make the decision, unfortunately, the hospitals will make a decision for you. And that is not where we want to be. You don't want to be in that situation. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really unfortunate. We have a lot of stories like that where um, people kind of just had decisions made for them. Um, you know, also the goals of patient treatment are less often discussed by doctors. Um, you know, not only are they less often discussed by doctors, what you want, but um, they also are not 
taking in account your cultural and or spiritual choices and decisions. This is something, again, that Antonia brought up. So we have to um, put it in front of them. We have to, them. It we have have to um, make sure that they have it. We cannot assume that they know simply because they are a doctor or a medical professional. Um, goals of patient and treatment are less often recorded by doctors um, in the chart. So they're, they're also don't even sometimes don't know, um, you know, are not following up, are not accustomed to, don't have a, like experience with kind of, I would say, prioritizing our needs. And this is why we have to kind of be proactive in naming them. And then lastly, even when African Americans have written goals of care in chart, they're often not followed or respected. And I think this for me is extremely, extremely important. This to me, this is why people are talking about medical racism and, and, and just being ignored because we've given you the, 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 the goals, we've given you the plan and you're ignoring it. And I think when we do, this is how we can support each other. This is how we can lift this up and, and really start to find more, better ways to make sure that our voices are heard and our, our plans and our goals are, are uh, met. Um, next slide, please. Um, in addition to meeting those goals, we also have to make sure part of what we have to do to make to meet those goals is to overcome barriers. So this means that, in a, you know, if we're going to uh, deal with the uh, medical racism and the mistrust, we have to do it, you know, it, with, through several kind of ways and, and, and processes and, 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 and kind of um, attempts and efforts. One of those is kind of cultural sensitivity training for providers. You know, this is something that is needed across the board. Uh, nurses, doctors, you know, hospice care, all across the board. And it also, I would add, you know, medical students when they are in school, the, the, the training that is needed is, is, is extremely vast and extremely deep and, uh, you know, in, in all corners of the medical uh, industry and, and, and you know, uh, system. We also need creative use of mixed media to educate, um, you know, patients and their families. Um, you know, part of what we've been doing at our organization is creating, uh, you know, kind of the um, di different uh, like outputs, um, you know, for for communities so that they can see this easier uh, than they've been able to see it uh, before, you know, and, and, you know, I, I think sometimes when we animate this, it's easier um it's easier so so that's kind of one of the things we need to be able to do is is to create you know actual tangible uh examples of of what we're talking about um we also need communication strategies so speak to people not at them i think that's extremely important um you know we should be creating we also have a list of questions um, you know, that you can be asking in these situations. And I think that helps you really get people to speak to you and not at you. When you also have questions, when you um, know, you know, what you, what is it you want and you have questions now, um, you know, you can, you can relay that information back. And as a professional, you should be speaking to people, not at them and ask questions if you don't know. Um, we also want you know, folks to kind of understand that teams are reflective of the community being served. So you need to partner with trusted community partners, including the faith community. And of course, you know, NHPCO is an excellent example of a partner that can provide those resources. Um, and, and we believe that in doing that, um, you're championing the, that work and you can kind of be that at your institution and bring others along. It's important. We need it now more than ever. We are. We have not, you know, uh, escaped, you know, the the uh, the the grasp of of racism. Uh, we've actually. It it we we're, we're still. It's still rearing uh, its face. It's still uh, something that we have to consider every uh, step of the way. And so we need allies who are going to partner with community-based organizations to do this work. Um, also, you know, we have to understand and acknowledge the role that faith plays in healthcare decision 
making. Uh, and we must reframe things and lean into faith. Uh, faith is a uh, powerful, powerful tool. It's a powerful, powerful, you know, kind of, um, work, you know, it, it's one's belief system. It's what they, it, was, it, it wakes them up every morning and it, and it puts them to sleep. And so we have to use faith as a way to create bridges and not barriers. Um, and then lastly, you know, we must help families understand that to support, you know, support of hospice is additional support. It's a kind of a caregiver tool um, and, and it strengthens what they do and, and to not abandon it. And I think that is extremely important because uh, oftentimes, um, you know, we may see something and we may ask, well, why this or why that? Um, but the hospice should be able to really embolden families to not, you know, remove them from, from having any um, uh, responsibility or ownership of the process. But unfortunately, in order to do that, we need hospice to also really be, you know, to, to, to be the best hospice care it can be. Um, and we need to eliminate Right and 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 lessen the examples of when hospice care is um, really inadequate for Black families. Next slide, please. All right. Before we move on to the case study, I just want to let our um, participants, uh, our, our faculty, pause for just a second to catch their breath. We're going to move on to the case study shortly. Um, but I did want to let folks know there's some uh, great dialogue happening in the chat and I um, want to assure everyone that our team will capture some of that information um, and we'll share it as part of the key takeaways. So I didn't want folks to think that we were ignoring your, you know, what was going on down there. But uh, Corona, if you want to move on to the next slide, we can start with the case study. So here for our case study, this is the situation. A woman was diagnosed with advanced stage four lung cancer only after having symptoms of a moist cough that would not go away. It was noted that she had never really been sick in her entire life, nor, she, nor had she ever smoked. However, her husband had smoked and, and she spent years breathing in secondhand smoke. Next. <clears throat> so more background here. She's a prominent, well-respected member of a large African-American church. She's God-fearing and a strong woman of faith and a spirit of generosity. She is known for list her listening ear and her sound biblical advice. She was dependable and always there to visit the sick and shut in, cooking meals, um, running errands, doing things to help ease caregiver stress um, for her church members. She even taught Sunday school and was viewed as an epitome of a godly woman. Upon, a, upon learning her diagnosis, her response was simply, God's got this. And her insurance of God's never failing love and healing power remained at the forefront of every conversation she had and every healthcare decision she made over the next several months. She agreed to chemotherapy as a treatment option with committing only to three treatments, one for the father, one for the son, and one for the Holy Spirit. And she viewed physicians as helpers in the healing process, but only God could guarantee life. So the assessment, the patient connected with a well-respected oncologist and after her first appointment, she was told that if she followed the treatment plan, her life could be extended for two more years. After two chemotherapy treatments, the tumor mass appeared to be shrink shrinking and um, they were very hopeful, her and her oncologist were very hopeful and a third treatment was completed. After the third treatment, uh, her side effects got worse, uh, mouth sores, rashes, extreme fatigue and abnormal blood counts. And with these being unbearable um, and she only planning to do three treatments, she was adamant now to stop the chemotherapy. So in a conversation with the oncologist about stopping chemotherapy treatment, he revealed to her that he had actually increased her dose from the first two. Um, and um, so he told her that. So then she expressed severe disappointment in the fact that he changed her care plan without uh, consulting with her. And at that point, she opted to move her care now to her primary care physician and again, stop the treatment of chemotherapy. 
<clears throat> so, excuse me, so the outcomes here. The PCP worked with her to palliate her symptoms over several months and then ultimately refer her to hospice care. Her PCP was aware of her spiritual beliefs, as he was in her doctor for a while, and had incorporated that into his approach with her, even saying things like he would pray for her. Um, she never hesitated to call her doctor with the symptoms and concerns she had. And when she finally agreed to hospice care, she explained to the family that she had not given up, but she needed support from professionals who could help with her uh, symp uh, symptoms like palate. Sorry, I can't talk. She needed help with support from professionals trained in palliative care, and they knew that she would continue to fight and believe in God through, for healing through this process. And by the time she was admitted to hospice, she went directly into an um, inpatient hospice unit where she spent her final days there, where she was visited by church members and friends, and she would often smile and keep smiles, keep staying abreast of the church news. And then she did die comfortably on Easter Sunday morning in the unit. So so let me do a quick recap of the case, everyone, um, and then we'll turn it to our participants just for a moment to ask um, you, Altanya, if there's any clarifying questions about the case. So we have an African-American female who was diagnosed with advanced lung cancer. She was a very spiritual woman, deeply invested in her faith and her community as well, sounded like a lovely lady. Um, she had uh, specified specific goals for her care. Um, and uh, however, they were not followed um, by her oncologist. She was able to switch her care to her primary, who thankfully seemed like they, he paid a lot more attention to um, her wishes, um, including leaning into her faith, praying with her and things like that, um, and then was able to uh, transition appropriately to hospice, died you know, with the hospice support, as well as having the support of her community um, throughout the uh, last few days. Um, did I miss anything important um, of it? And, and while I'm uh, opening it up for questions, does anyone in our audience, our participants have any clarifying questions related to the case? And if our NHPCO team can help keep an eye on either hands or yellow squares. Okay, seems like a quiet group, but what we'll do is we'll move on to talking a little bit about this case. Um, Karina, do you wanna bring the slides back up and we can uh, move on to the next part? Rory, we have a, we have a question here um, from um, Chris regarding um, the, the uh, you know, Heidi's share regarding a family member. Uh, Heidi, can you share more about her family support structure? And is this is this question about? No, the I think I think those two got conflated. I think the question about the family support structure goes to the case study itself, yeah. and there seems to be another question about was the patient a DNR? And I think my story was to something that had been said before, and so I apologize if things got confused in there. No, I think Heidi, you, you had great stuff going on in the chat too. So it doesn't surprise me that there was some additional dialogue. So um, Altanya, could you speak to um, Chris's question around the family support structure? Yes, and um, some of the information is a case that, that I've uh, researched for this, but I don't, I don't they, didn't, they didn't have all that detail in there about our family support structure. She did have, I mean, she did have a strong family. Um, you know, she was married, I believe she had children. And then again, her church family, um, was very involved and supportive in her case. Um, and then her DNR status was not, hold on, I think, uh, was not noted, but I wanna double check as we continue to talk about it. Right, well, while you look that up, there was another question from Clarissa. Um, Clarissa, I don't know if you're able to come off mute for a second to ask your question to Altanya. Sure, hi, my name is Clarissa, um, HBM fellow at UNC. Just wondering if palliative care was involved during treatment. It doesn't look like palliative care was involved at all during treatment. No. And I cannot find a confirmation of her uh, DNR status. Thank you for checking. Any other questions about, clarifying questions about the case? Dr. Hall, do you have any, um, as a member of our faculty, any um, other questions that you would like some additional information on or Parna or Sarah? No, I think uh, the questions that were asked were sufficient that they did good job. 
Rory, we have a question in the chat uh, from Julie Frazier. Julie, are you able to hop off mute? Um, yes. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. So um, I was just wondering how, what sort of strategies can you use in the um, African American community when you're trying to forge relationships with hospice? Because quite a few of them, obviously, as we said earlier, that with um, with the spiritual faiths, it's very much about hope and healing. And so it's difficult to get into, you know, for folks to yeah. embrace hospice because it, then it looks like they're giving up and that they're not leaning on their faith. So how, what sort of strategies could we use? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. You know, some of the work that uh, we have a, a great faith manager on our team and some of the work that uh, she's been able to do um, is a um, first I would zoom out and say to not start simply uh, with just uh, churches in the African American community. I think that I would encourage you to start with faith leaders across all traditions, because that's extremely important to have that kind of to start uh, developing people in different traditions that are willing to and, and ready to and are starting to do that work in their faith community. That's one and that's important. Um, because then I think too, you can then start to really move other uh, uh, black faith leaders when they start to see others and you're all, and you say, hey, we are doing, we have this campaign going, we have this effort going, this initiative going, would you like to join? Would you like to be a part of something? We want, we want you to be a part of it. I think that's extremely important. I think the other thing also is, is how do you get uh, the supports? How do you start to provide information at churches? It's one thing to just, you know, to get them uh, to, you know, agree with with hospice or agree with, you know, um, any of the other things, but, um, but simply being able to provide resources, being able to, you know, ask people if they've started a will, you know, all of these kinds of things. I think there are ways to engage the church that are before you even get to hospice. I think are are really important, and I think they can also join in when they start to see campaigns you know where you're asking faith leaders to ask certain questions at the church you know to hold certain events at the church um i think that you know i think information is the way to go with the church uh and so uh i think information is is important and 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 really it's seeing them as a be as as a, a beacon of information and a place where that information you know where where, where they are asking if they have the most so that they can create the most informed church, you know, that there is. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall. And I think in the interest of time, we're going to move to the slide that is going to pose some additional probing questions for our, thank you, um, th thank you for your question, Julie. That was really great. So Parna, could you pull the slides back up? So for our participants, just to let um, you know, our faculty have come up with some questions for discussion. So we're going to move on to slide 22. So I think we've, we've, we kind of started getting into this stuff a little bit, but um, the questions on the slide that we'd love to pose to our participants um, center around what could the oncologist have done differently? Give us your perspective if you feel the oncologist breached trust regarding the treatment plan, or was it a mat matter of poor communication? What behaviors from the PCP should always be practiced? What lessons or uh, practices can hospice and palliative care providers take away from this case? And of course, we'd just love to hear your feedback if there are any other points that stood out or particularly salient to you. So again, we're gonna open it up to the floor. I'll let our participants provide some thoughts and responses to the discussion questions. Um. I, I'm going to apologize. I do have a staff meeting that I need to attend, but I wanted to look at the oncologist um, and the concept of the breach of trust or poor communication. And I think one of the things that we tend to forget when we do talk about communication is that not only is that about, you know, not listening, but it's about the giving and receiving of information and ideas. And quite often um, when um, consultants are talking they're really talking at you and not to you and if they're 
they themselves do not have a faith, they often don't understand the importance of faith. So um, I don't think it was so much a breach of trust. I just think it was um, lack of understanding and maybe they need some training and some teaching too. So that's what I wanted to say, but I am so sorry. I've been really wrapped in this and I've enjoyed it, but I do have to run. But thank you very much. It's thank been, you. Uh, been Thank great. you for joining us, Julie. There'll be information <laughs> sent out that you can probably watch the recording later. But I also want to call David out, if that's okay. David Pasco um, uh, responded uh, to this question and also kind of uh, speaks a little bit to what Julie was talking about. David, are you willing to come off mute and um, speak to yeah, your- Yeah, sure. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I, I do think um, I think this this goes beyond poor communication. Uh, the woman had agreed to three treatments. She explained why. Um, I don't understand why the oncologist would have increased her dosage uh, without her without any discussion. Number one, and then secondly, without her consent. Uh, I, I think um, this is a clear breach of trust and faith between, between patient and provider, uh, and seems to be what, you know, what precipitated a, 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 a deterioration in her health and well-being, her lack of uh, will to continue with the oncology and to defer back to her primary care provider. So I think it's a lynch point. Uh, and I think one we should, you know, we should all look at um, and take very seriously. Thank you, David. Uh, Jill, I see you have your hand raised and then Mariset. So Jill, why don't you come off mute? So I wanted to go off of what he just said in regards to doctors and I've, I've seen it personally with my, my mother um, who also had lung cancer um, and I, I, I'm curious to what doctors' thoughts are about getting doctors to hear their patients, like somebody else said about, you know, it's like they just tell you what you have to do and they're not listening to you. Um, and getting these doctors to understand that your spiritual faith or your personal beliefs or whatever do play a factor in your health. And I, I think that I've seen it more and more where they 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 don't take anything into consideration. And it's very difficult, especially for like an African-American. I've had patients say to me, my doctors never said that to me. So, or they'll say, well, why are you telling this, this? My doctors never said this. I wanna talk to my doctor before. So it really, you know, you, you say to teach and educate the doctors more, but there's no, there's a wall there. I, I don't, I'm curious what you see we can do to break down those barriers when we're trying to work as a team with doctors. As a patient family advocate for the company I work for, I'm constantly telling doctors, I really want to work with you. Tell me how I can work with you. So any, any suggestions on any of that? I'm thinking that that's being posed to Altanya and or Dr. Hall. So with physicians, it is a challenge um, because oftentimes they feel like they, they failed, they bring this, these things up. And um, so the opposite I've been working with is trying to inform the, the consumer to bring it up, to talk about it more um, because physicians oftentimes um, don't want to, they, they don't know how, they don't have time to, or they're afraid to. That's what I found uh, when talking to physicians or why they, not, why they don't bring up um, these topics and be clear. Um, I talk about leading from a place of trust, trust, give people they deserve, informed, you know, consent about what's going on with their health and, and um, have an option of this care as a part of their care option. And it's not giving up and things like that, or the doctor didn't fail. So looking at that as a care option and not a, um, you know, you, they lost in this, you know, this kind of thing. So that part, and then really working with the consumer, with the patient, the families to be able to know more about what this is, to be able to ask for it and bring it up themselves. Um, it's kind of the approach I've been taking um, as of late. 
I don't know if anyone else on the call, uh, Dr. Hall or any other participants even have any um, suggestions to share with that. I welcome that. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think that's excellent. Um, and um, I would just add that I think we have to do more. Um, this is both an advocacy issue and a policy issue in my, in my opinion. So when we, we see doctors changing and, and, and accommodating and doing what we need when, it's, when policy is in place, when they're, when they're absolutely required to and they must. And we must also look at this issue as a issue where we have to also be putting these pieces into place and say, you know what, this is what we need. And I also think that, um, you know, we can make, try to make social contracts and um, or, or contracts in general. How can we get doc, what can we get doctors to commit to in the beginning? Um, I think that's really important. Um, but, and I think also that there may be ways to uh, find ways to go through other, other parts of the, the team or other parts of the medical facility, how, you know, um, but get others involved. I'll just say that. Don't just leave it up to the doctor, get others involved, bring other people in and, um, and, and, and do everything you can to advocate for yourself and your family. I love that, Dr. Hall, and I love the idea of also engaging champions you find within your own care setting to be additional advocates for your patient and your families. Uh, Mariset, uh, you're next, and then Clarissa after that. I'm just kind of going across the stream, so. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rory. It's so good to be with everyone this evening. Um, and, um, you know, there, there's so many thoughts that come to mind, and, and as I look at this particular case, I also wondered why the other team members of the oncology team, typically they will have a multidisciplinary team. And we don't know if social work got engaged with this uh, to be able to sort of uh, coordinate other additional services that could have supported this patient. I am I'm absolutely concerned that uh, the oncologist did not express regret uh, in not including the patient in the decision. And I think that's the piece too that was more of the, the hurtfulness for this patient was that she wasn't given the opportunity to make the decision as to whether she wanted stronger treatment. But when she made the decision uh, to move away from treatment and knowing the disease trajectory, it would have been appropriate uh, as our colleague from UNC said, why wasn't palliative care brought up as an option? Because that would have been complimentary for the primary care physician to have had a palliative care partner uh, on that journey uh, with uh, the patient, the primary care physician and the palliative care specialist uh, to ensure and still be able to uh, have that interdisciplinary team approach. It was several months before we got to hospice. And I just feel that there was, uh, that that patient could have had that as, uh, as, uh, as an on-ramp to really help um, provide that support. Uh, that she needed during that time. Lastly, I will say that we do need to empower our patients and families and our community members with information. I agree with our, our faculty today. They are spot on. Um, we cannot, we must partner with our communities. We can't just try to get in there so we can get referrals, but we need to really be a meaningful partner uh, and find ways that we can really put, position ourselves with cultural and spiritual humility. Uh, because that will make the difference uh, down the road in terms of the care that we provide and, and put ourselves in a position to really hear those stories. I am involved right now with a research project where uh, an AME uh, group of churches in North Carolina, they are creating a spiritual uh, uh, ACP guide that incorporates their faith traditions along with information about how to go through advanced care planning, what those benefits are. It can be done. And so I think I love the fact um, that we should lean in and create those bridges and, and break down barriers. Love that. Thank you, Marisette. Um, Clarissa, and then if we have time, I want to move to Brianna. Um, Jane and Toby, if we don't have time to get to your question, would you please put it in the chat so we can make sure that we get um, our faculty uh, information back to you. But uh, to you, Clarissa. I think Marisette kind of covered most of what I was going to um, add to the conversation. 
But I do want to go back to um, the oncologist breaching the trust, the poor communication, and and not trying to defend my profession and my colleagues. But I think this is sort of like a holdover of a paternalistic way of uh, practice in medicine, where what I say as the doctor goes, you I write the script, you take the pills, and that's it. There's no shared decision. Well, I've I've recently graduated, and we are taught shared decision making. So hopefully newly minted doctors coming in years, you will see a difference in attitude towards that where it's more of a shared decision. It's more of talking to the patients and see what do you want? What are your goals? What do you think? Because it makes no sense if I give you a pill and you don't take it anyway, right? Uh, so hopefully we don't see much more of this. And I would hope that the oncologist would have engaged her more in shared decision. That is a breach of her trust. And I mean, I would dare even say it's a bit of an insult to her physically because you're doing something to her body that she did not necessarily want you to. We can go down the legal path of that another time. Uh, but palliative care should have been involved way before she even decided not to. I do want to point out that I'm very impressed that she was empowered enough to say enough is enough and walk away from it because so many times a lot of uh, older back patients, they just kind of stay and they keep taking the meds and they keep doing the things and they feel helpless. I cannot tell you the number of times I've seen a helpless look on someone's face that, oh, the doctor said I have to do it, so I must, which is not the case. You do have the power to say no. So I do uh, appreciate Marisette, uh putting that out there, that empowering families, uh, empowering patients to speak up for themselves uh, so they can be part of those conversations for their care. You probably warmed everyone's heart, Clarissa, that we all know that doctors are being taught shared decision-making these days. So thank you for that. Um, and I think we have time to get to Brianna and I apologize to Jane and Toby whose hands were up and I'm not sure we'll be able to get to your question. So please put it in the chat, but Brianna that you get the last question of the day. Oh, wow. That is uh, quite a bit of pressure. Um, but I, I definitely just uh, agree with what Marissa and Clarissa were saying. Um, they hit all of the points that I was going to make. One other point that um, I would like to hit on really quickly, just I guess to bring it back to hospice, is what can we potentially take away from this case? And I think that once uh, Black patients come into hospice, um, there is a lot of fear. Um, they've gone through the ringer by that point, um, not being listened to, not being heard, not understanding case plans, not understanding medications. The families um, are, are kind of at their wits end um, with be, being a, becoming a caregiver overnight, not understanding if they're doing the right thing. Um, and so I think that what hospice and palliative care providers can take from this case is understanding that once they come into our care, they may be at the end of their rope. Um, and so that is a place for us to then pick up on the, the education, the compassion, um, filling, up, filling them up with resources um, and letting them know that the end doesn't have to look like the entirety of their healthcare journey to get to this point. Um, I think that that puts hospice in a really special place um, in a lot of families' lives and a lot of people's healthcare journeys um, to know that, you know, it may have been treacherous to get to, to the end to get to hospice. But here, um, at this point, you will be communicated with effectively, you will be in charge of your care plan, we will um, listen to your advanced directives, or we will help you form them, um, if you're cognitive and, and can do that, um, and that we will provide resources to the families, and that once that per your loved one has passed away, we will still be there for you um, 13 months or however long after, however long you need us. Um, I think that that is something that we can take away is that um, we get to be a lot of times the very end um, of, of people's healthcare journeys. And that is just a very special place to be. Thanks, Brianna. I really appreciate your perspective. And I think you did a great job closing our session out. So um, uh, Karuna, if you wouldn't mind, could you move over to the recommendations? Um, just for our participants to be aware, these are recommendations um, that will um, definitely make sure you have access to, but um, I think this really echoes a lot of what um, has already been discussed today. Obviously, you know, we know that the oncologist should have established a stronger physician slash patient relationship, asking those questions about cultural beliefs and religious beliefs, those questions about what matters to you. What My favorite question is, what do I need to know to take better care of you? And that covers a whole host of things, you know, and that brings your family into it. These are the people that matter to me, all of those kinds of things, because understanding these beliefs um, help us better understand how they're gonna impact that person's 
not just their care decisions, advanced care planning, but just how they approach their health and their illness. Um, some other important recommendations um, is that we're just being aware of is that PCP who knew the patient for years um, and was aware of and acknowledged her strong faith, I'm sure, and really uh, reinforced that by praying with her and things like that, um, as evidenced by the fact that she trusted him, trusted his recommendation for hospice, um, and worked on how to share updates with the family, similar to what you were talking about, Brianna. Um, and again, re re reiterating how you sort of uh, close things out, hospice and palliative care providers meet patients where they are and offer open access or expanded care options. You know, our job is to walk alongside them and whatever that path looks like, you know, it's our, uh, you know, we're there to walk that with folks. And the last recommendation is that for many in the Black and African American community, end of life care decisions may represent more of a spiritual choice, um, not a medical choice. I love that the case really laid out that that was um, very much the perspective of um, the patient, you know, that physicians were healers, helpers to, not healers, physicians were helpers to God being the healer. I thought that was a really lovely way of wording it. So Karuna, can you move on to the last slide? Um, the key takeaways that we have for today, in addition to so many great things that came in the chat, and we'll try to capture as much of it as we can, is that we're aware that there is disparity in hospice utilization. There's a racial disparity um, in uh, hospice utilization and Medicare decedents who use hospice. Um, this is often influenced by social determinants of health, but also a number of other things that um, were laid out um, in the didactic portion. Barriers to care include um, family reluctance to um, you know, sort of step away from that role in, in caregiving, misconceptions that um, many have around hospice um, hastening death. We already talked about the mistrust of the healthcare system and I like the way Dr. Hall worded it. Um, you know, this, I wrote it down, medical racism. I think that is a new phrase and I think we need to lean into um, that, whether we contribute to it or you need to call it out when we see it. Um, it comes from a, a lot of things um, and I think that's something that you know we really can do a little more exploring. Um, and also we underscored today the role of faith in Black and African American community. Um, it plays a major role in decision making. There's a strong presence of faith beliefs in the illness experience where God is recognized as in charge and the pastor's role is fundamental. Um, uh, Mara said, I'm gonna ask you to help me remember and I'll send it out to this group when we are done, but um, at the caregiver uh, round table that we were at a year ago, um, there was a wonderful presentation from somebody who uh, worked with the, the churches in her community to really support folks with serious illness and actually um, talking to the faith community about that so that the fam family felt more comfortable um, bringing their loved one um, who felt a little awkward because of the decision, uh, the illness that they had um, coming to uh, church. And it was a really lovely uh, movement that she began. Um, and I'm going to help Marissa, make you help me remember what it was, uh, the woman that was that presented, because it was so good. Um, do you remember? Oh, uh, Rory, I don't remember, but uh, I will go back in my brain to see if it comes up. So it some was, of my colleagues on the line may remember, but. <laughs> it was it was great. We'll, and we'll make sure we send it out because I just thought it was such a lovely way of educating, you know, the faith community about um, and certain serious illness care and end of life options, but also just making a really welcoming um, environment for um, the patients and their families. So we'll share more about that. And often um, uh, in the community, hope for a miracle is a common sentiment. So uh, not to take away hope from pa patients and families is a critical role that we all play in hospice and palliative care. So as we conclude, um, can you move on to the next slide, Karuna? Um, the references um, that were um, scattered throughout the didactic portion are included here. We'll make sure that that is um, uh, something that's up on our website that you have access to if there's any things here that you would like to do some additional reading on. Um, and next slide. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, the session evaluation and certificate of completion, those are two separate surveys and we appreciate your feedback. So please take a moment to complete the Project ECHO, Echo session evaluation. Um, and also if you are interested in obtaining that certificate of participation, please take a moment to do the continuing education knowledge, uh, the knowledge check, that's a different survey. And then coming up in two weeks, we have another Project ECHO session. Aparna, can you advance the slide for me? Uh, February 16th is uh, Caring Through Crisis, followed by March 2nd, which is Cultural Humility in Pediatric Care. We hope you all have the, uh, that marked on your calendar, and we look forward to having you join us then. So at this, thank you again for being a member of our Project ECHO um, series this month. We hope you have a lovely afternoon, and take care. Bye, everybody.